you will, and turn to Romans 12. Romans chapter 12. I'm continuing on the series of messages that deal with the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is the key to Christian living. The understanding that Christ is in the believer is the only thing that makes that believer's life what God intended it be. We have taken as our first text in this series of messages and as our general text, Philippians 2 and 5, which says, Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. I like one translation of that that says, Allow the mind of Christ to be in you that was in Christ Jesus. The word allow and the word let both suggest that this mind is already available. It's not something that's going to come to you on the basis of your understanding, your principles, what you've learned over a lifetime, and so forth. It means that there is available to you the mind of Christ. Well, this leads us to the thought of what would be the mind of Christ then, because we are strong teachers in the Christ life that the mind of Christ is not living like Jesus of Nazareth lived because that's one of the foundation stones that you cannot live like Jesus of Nazareth lived, neither are you intended to live like Jesus of Nazareth lived. We're intended to live our life with Christ in us, Christ coming out of us as we are. So what is the mind of Christ? Well, this took us to the next verse of Scripture, which was in 1 Corinthians 2 and 16, the little line that says, but you have the mind of Christ. Now, it seems like the Apostle Paul might have moved from the fact that there is available the mind of Christ to the fact that the believer already has the mind of Christ. Now, that's really mind-blowing because most people have spent a lifetime trying to figure out what the Lord wanted them to do. And in every little situation and circumstances of life, they try to figure out what they're to do in that. But Paul says, but you have the mind of Christ. That's a juncture in our thought life that simply says, you not only have it available, you already have it. Well, our study there took us to the fact of Jesus introducing the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16. Those three chapters explain what Jesus thought of the Holy Spirit as he presented him as a teacher. The Holy Spirit was a teacher. And by the time you get through studying what Christ had to say about the Holy Spirit in those three chapters, you now are convinced that it is the Holy Spirit who is the teacher and therefore is the constituted mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit, therefore, is the mind of Christ. He's the one who's teaching you who Jesus is. Now, why was this necessary? This was absolutely necessary because Christ in the believer is an unknown entity. Most Christians who are born again, all of them who are born again, and most who call themselves Christians are going to live and die and never know Christ was in them. Now, they're going to have all sorts of of uh, di uh, divisions and diverse things to happen to them, like some are going to claim their church constitutes Christ or the Holy Spirit constitutes Christ or my ministry constitutes Christ, but they're never going to know Christ is in them until the true gospel is preached. So I would say 90% of Christians are going to live and die and never really know the Christ that is in them. Isn't that a shame that you could live and die? I heard a story the other day of a young woman who was trying to find her, her one of her relatives, I think her aunt, and she was spending all her money in her entire life trying to find that one aunt who was, I think, her last living relative, so to speak. And I thought, what an effort she put forth. What a tremendous amount of money she spent to do that. And I thought about Christ living in every believer. Any one of the believers who ever read the Bible read, Christ lives in you. The life you live is Christ. Such potent scriptures. And yet I find very few Christians that are interested in finding that out. So they substituted the church for that knowledge. They substitute the Holy Spirit for that knowledge. And yet Paul says, but you have the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? It's the work of the Holy Spirit in your soul mind. 
because that's where the Holy Spirit lives and works in the believer is in the mind so that the believer would always know what Jesus in him was doing and what Christ in him wanted to do because the Holy Spirit was refining the mind in order that he could know that. Then we go to our third scripture, which I'm going to talk about today in Romans 12. We'll not read the scripture yet. I don't think I'm quite ready for it, but it's the line that says, be renewed in your mind. So now we have three prominent scriptures before us. Let this mind be in you, but you have the mind of Christ. And now be renewed in your mind. If I was going to renew your mind about the things of the Lord, I think I'd have to start with two words. Two of the most important words, I think, to our Father, our Heavenly Father. Now I'm putting ideas in his mind, you might think, but I would say that there are no more words that are more important to the Heavenly Father than these two words. They are the word believe and the word love. Well, those are very common words. Those are two big Christian words, believe and love. But if I was going to renew your mind about what God had done in you the moment you were born again, I think I'd start talking about these two words. I'd have to start in the pre-Adamic period. I have to go before the world was created. I'd have to start with that very small portion of Scripture that deals with the Father's house before he created anything on this earth. I'd have to start with the fact that God had in his house cherubims and cherubims and angels and archangels. And for some reason, which uh, only God knows, I'm sure, he took one of the archangels named Lucifer and made him the head of his household, made him sort of the great power in his house. Now, as to why God did that, it's hard to imagine. We have a prophetic utterance of that given to us in Ezekiel chapter 38 when he talks about the king of Salem. That's referring to the devil in the father's house. And so, obviously, the father wanted somebody in his house whom he had created to honor him and love him and obey him and so forth. So he took this one creature, Lucifer, an archangel, and he gave him everything he had. He was the most powerful. He owned everything. He was sort of the right hand of God. Well, you know the story that Lucifer turned against God. I guess what had happened was that he thought he owned all this and was so great and powerful he could actually put God out of his own house. And he probably attempted that. He ran a coup against God, and a third of the angels followed him, and so God had to put Lucifer and a third of the angels out of his house. Now, the point I make there is that Lucifer owned everything God had. I cannot believe that God held back anything from him. But Lucifer never appreciated God. Lucifer never honored God. And the fact is, looking at these words, we have to say that Lucifer had everything God could give him, but he never loved God. He was in the presence of God continually, but he never loved God. He worked for God, but he never loved God. He didn't love. So this was a powerful lesson. From the fact of Lucifer and the Father's house, much of our gospel has been created by God. I can see that. I can see that God wanted somebody to love him. Why? Because God is love. He's love. John didn't say in his uh, epistle that God gave love or that God just wanted people to love him. He made the bold statement simply God is love. You get that? 
That's what he is. He isn't power. He isn't just a creator. He isn't just all the other things you could attribute to him. The outright statement is he is love, and all these other things are subtitles to what he is. Basically, God is love. Well, what does love demand? More love. When love is put upon somebody, what's its objective? That they would return love. That's all God ever wanted. So God, who is love, gave everything he had to Lucifer. But what did he get from Lucifer? He got the opposite of true love. He got self. See, that's the real opposite. Not, not hate, not, uh, not evil, not madness. He got self. What was wrong with Lucifer? He was a self for self. He thought he could be something within himself. So when God loves and we don't receive it, then the return to God is our selfishness. Self. Well, when God created the world, he put a man in it. Now, there's a strong relationship between Lucifer and Adam. That relationship is they're both created absolutely created. Neither one of them are birthed by God. Adam begins the human race, but the human race is not birthed by God. That's an important factor, you see. So that leaves us to a fact that even though Lucifer and Adam were both created by God, neither one of them, neither of them, had within themselves the ability to love God. It wasn't there. They didn't have that ability to love God because they were created beings. Created. That's why you and I do not have the ability within ourselves to love God in our created being. Created being. So let's talk about that a little more. God created Adam out of the dust of the ground, but he also put a touch on him where the scripture says he was created in the image and likeness of God. See, So here we have Adam set out in the garden. He's created in the image and likeness of God. He could be like God. He could even look like God, image. But what he didn't have was anything of God in him. Now, God breathed into him the breath of life, but the breath of life didn't give him a nature, and it didn't give him a spirit. The breath of life, plainly the scripture said, made him a living creature or a living soul. So what we have in the garden is a soul and a body. Soul and a body. And from that soul and body, there's a thing that I say comes off the aura of that called the spirit of man. That's not the important factor. We have the created Adam in that garden. Created. Now, Lucifer comes. He's going to attack God one way or another. He got kicked out of the Father's house. So he's going to attack God one way or another. And what he's going to do is attack the created aspect of Adam. Because in the created aspect of Adam, there is no love. What is in the created aspect of Adam? The ability to make a choice. That's the big thing. Well, that takes us to our other word, believe. So what God did to a human being when he created him was to put in him a mechanism where he could believe something. Just believe. Now, when you talk about the word believe, your mind automatically goes to believing God, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, believing the scriptures. But that's not the way this word is used. There is a mechanism in every created human being to believe, or let's say to make a choice. You believe something, so you choose. You make a choice. Now, Adam had that ability, and Lucifer had that ability. Lucifer had the ability to make a choice against God. Adam had the ability 
to believe what Lucifer said. Look at that for a moment. Here was Adam, a created being. He had a mind. He had a soul mind. God had breathed into him and made that mind vibrant and alive. So what had God done? Before he ever met Lucifer, God had given Adam a set of information. Some information. What was the information? How to run the world. He was over the heavens, over the things on the earth, things under the earth, and over the sea. He had the power to run the universe. Since that time, nobody has ever had that power. What sin did was destroy the human ability of anybody to run this world. Humans will never run this world right, and the only time this world is ever taken hold of by a human is when Father Satan occupies the Antichrist and when finally Jesus Christ comes back. That's the only time there'll ever be powers that can run this world. Think of that. So now he had a set of information, let's say on the left side of his brain, how to run this world. And then all of a sudden, he and Eve met the devil. Now, the devil was beautiful, beautiful serpent, most beautiful thing in the garden. And what did Satan do? Satan gave him another set of information. It wasn't bad information. It looked like it was good stuff that would come from God, but it was directly opposite to God's message. So what did Adam have? He had in that mind of his, where God had made it alive by his own breath, he had two sets of information. Now, poor old Adam didn't know what a woman was. He didn't know what children was. He didn't know what animals could do. He didn't know what to eat. He didn't know how the world came about. He didn't know that two and two made four. He didn't know anything but what God had put in his mind. And now he had another set of information from the devil. So what was it God had put in a created creature? He had put in the created creature the ability to believe. Ah. He said, you know what, Adam? I believe what this snake says. I believe it. Adam says, okay, that sounds good. We believe it. What did he do? He had the power to believe something. That's in everybody's mind. You have the power to believe. And so what did he do? He believed the wrong thing, and that was the cardinal sin against God. That was the devil's master stroke in his attack against God. And now then, God, to be just, had to pass that sin on every one that was birthed by Adam. Every natural birth would have that same sin passed upon them. We call it the sin nature or the Satan nature. It was passed upon all men from that time on. But notice something. Neither Adam nor Lucifer ever loved God. I have always thought that a God who is love had Lucifer or Adam, either one, fallen on their knees and said, God, forgive us. We're sorry for what we did. You know what would have happened? I believe God would have forgiven either one of them. He would have forgiven them. But you know what? Neither one of them did that. They didn't do that. So the end result was the sin of Satan passed through Adam who would pass on to the human race that same sin. Believe. Now, human beings that come into this world come into the world with the ability, a mechanism in them to believe. They can believe. Most don't believe the right things, but they have a mechanism to believe. See, I want you to see that God put it there. It's that ability to make a choice that God gave to every human. And that choice is the paramount foundation for the free moral agency of human beings. They have the ability to make a choice. Think of that. That's a great thing God put in us, that we could make a choice. Why did God leave that choice and that ability to believe neutral? It's a neutral thing. You could either believe right or you can believe wrong. Uh, 
A couple of weeks ago, a man walked into a Baptist church in Fort Worth, took a gun, killed seven people, and turned killed himself. And when we got to reading the record of what that man was, he was, he was a nut. He was a fool. He was nearly insane. He believed everything contrary to, to life, to the government, to God. He was a believer. He was a great believer. In fact, he, he believed more than most people believe because he did something about his belief. In his insanity, he kills eight people, took his own life. He was a believer. So the point I'm making to you is that people have the ability to believe something. And most people who believe wrong believe they're right. Have you noticed that? They believe they're right. Why? God put it there like that. God fixed them like that. Had God put that mechanism in us to believe and to make choices that were solely favored in his direction, that would have been contrary to God. There would have been no love. So what is it that God wanted out of a believer? He wanted somebody to love him. He wanted you to love him. He didn't fix you so you would believe only in him. He didn't fix you so you'd believe only in Jesus Christ. The issue with him was I'm going to fix them so they can believe what they want to. And if they love me, that'll be good because that's what I really want. But I want it to be free, moral love. I want them to love me because they want me. Amen. See, that man that killed seven people the other day did what he did on the basis of that mechanism in him that believes. And I've got to digress here for a moment. Because you know the thing that triggers the mechanism of your choice making and believing? What triggers it the most is the gospel. Think about it now. Some people used to get weary with me talking about the true gospel and all, but that's the only thing that triggers the mechanism in you and balances it for God is the gospel. Paul said it one day. He said, how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall he preach except he be sent? What was he talking about? He was talking about somebody that had the message that could take either the imbalance or the neutrality of the believing part of man and turn them to God. You know why most people get saved? It's because they believe the wrong things. See, they had a right to that. They could believe whatever they wanted to. You take a young woman who wastes her life away in riotous living. Uh, she's a sex fiend. She's, she's a drunkard. Uh, God fixed her so she could believe that's the way she ought to live. If he hadn't done that, then the God who is love could never get a follower, a true follower, because true love demands all. It demands that change from what you were to to who he is. That's what love is. That's what true love is all about. Well, let's go a step further. The human being, then, doesn't have the ability to love. It isn't in us, in our created part to love. If we get any lesson from people who have just been created, that's all they've had is one birthing, natural birthing, the fact is they can't love within themselves. Are you ready for that? Now that's a bold, uh, almost scientific thought coming from me. They don't have the ability to true love. They were not intended to true love within themselves because the mechanism of believing has to completely turn to a choice for God. For only God is love, and those without God cannot love. So in God's dealing with human beings, he fixed it so there would be two birthings, two absolute birthings for the human being. First is your natural birthing, your natural birthing. In your mother's womb, God touched you to be something for his glory. 
created in the image and likeness of God, Adam's offspring, a human being. But even as Adam was, so were you in the mother's womb created to bring honor and glory to God. But you know what? The moment you were delivered from that mother's womb, God caused the sin of Adam, of a created being, to be passed upon you, and created beings within themselves can never please God. They can't please God. They can't love God, and they'll never make the right decisions. They won't believe right. It isn't in them to do that. Why did God do that? Why didn't he allow some human beings to come out of a mother's womb ready to reach out to God and to love him? Because true love demands the decision. He can't make you do it. Do you understand that? You ever, you always hear somebody say, well, God made me do that. Never. Never. I mean, the scriptures and the Holy Spirit can put you in a corner to where you think. That's what's happening to you, but God makes you do nothing because God is love. Love doesn't make you do anything. What does love wait for? Reciprocating love. Reciprocating love. That's what it waits for. That's what makes the human being what they ought to be. Well, it wasn't in a created human being. And so every baby that comes out of a mother's womb is marked by sin nature. They are carrying Adam's sin. They're carrying the sin of a created creature. It'll never work right. They'll never be what God touched them to be. I don't care if they become great musicians. God touched them in the mother's womb to be musical. They'll never be the fullness of what it is. God touched them to be. They'll never be that. So along the way, the gospel has to be preached. Now here's the gospel that is less preached than any other part of the scriptures. It's Jesus talking to Nicodemus. And he says to the spiritual leader of the Jews, you must be born again. Why did he say that to Nicodemus? He was talking to a man who was only created. He was just a created being. He was just like Lucifer and Adam. He was just like the children of Israel for 1,700 years who could not live by the law. So he said to him, Nicodemus, it's like this. From the very beginning, from the beginning before time, it's like this. God planned that there would be another birthing for that created human being. You see, we've got to get that fixed in our minds. This is something that has to do with our thinking, and if you don't start with this point, I have a hard time figuring how you're going to see the Scriptures consummate. How are you going to see it work? You have to start with the fact that God had a creature that he created that never pleased him within itself. That was you before you were saved, just like it was Lucifer and Adam. So the message from God's word was, you must be rebirthed. You must have another birthing. That first birthing by your parents left you no different than Adam was in his sin, no different than Lucifer was when he was kicked out of the father's house. That's an awesome idea, isn't it? You're no different. You may think you're good, you may try to do good, and some sinful people do much better than a lot of church people. But that has nothing to do with it. Jesus came and said to Nicodemus, you must be born again because that first birthing will not make you what you ought to be. Well, now, how did all that start? Let's go back to the word believe for a moment. Adam didn't believe. Here he was in the garden, and he had that whole set of information from God, and he didn't believe what God said. Now, if he had it all to do over, he'd believe. He'd believe. Adam would believe the second time around and probably rebuke that woman, whoever she was. But the facts were, he didn't believe. Didn't believe. 
Look at the history of men through the Old Testament. Take a look at Israel, God's chosen people. Who are those chosen people? They're a bunch of chosen created beings. Just created beings that within themselves cannot put it all together. Israel never put it all together. She still hasn't put it together. And she won't put it together till Jesus comes back. Why? The created being is an incompleted part of God's plan. So Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You've got to have another birthing. If you don't get this other birthing, the touch of God on you in the mother's womb will never give you fulfillment. It'll never give you completion. It'll never make you what you ought to be. You must be born again. Why was that necessary? Why was it necessary to rebirth? It was necessary because love never gets return love from a created human being. So what happened when you were rebirthed? By the incorruptible seed put in you, another person came about, which Paul was ready to say, it is Christ in you. Now, who is it that loves God perfectly? Who is the only one that ever loved God perfectly? Who is the only one that never spoke against nor turned against the Heavenly Father. Who is the only one who is perfect to God? The rebirthing was the only way God could get returning love. Now that opens up a whole different subject, you see, because just because God would require people to be born again, Jesus said you must be born again, but just because that was required didn't mean it would work out right because we still have the issue of believing. We still have the issue of choice making. So God put the lover in us. Who is it that loves God in me? It's Christ. What is it about me I can't trust? My love. My choices. I can't trust them. Don't you understand that? You can't trust yourself. Every time you trust yourself, you're just like Lucifer. You're just like Adam. What did Lucifer say to Adam? said, if you eat of the fruit of this tree, you'll be as God. What was it that stirred in old Adam? His self. Oh, I'll be something. I'll be somebody. That's what you and I are. Without Christ in us, we're self. But even with Christ in us, we still have that selfishness if our mind hadn't changed. If we don't know what's happened to us, Christian can be just as selfish as anybody in the world. But what do they have in them that the world doesn't have? They have Christ in them. What is Christ to God? He's God's return love. He's God's return love. Paul says the Holy Spirit will spread abroad in your hearts the love of God. That's what it's all about. That's why the rebirthing is so important. That's why Jesus said you must be born again, because God could only get lovers by putting Christ in us. It wasn't in us. is isn't in us. Don't you see that? It's in our world today. There's not very few people who love. We're all mechanical. We like the money. Uh, we back sin. Christians back sin Amen. when money's involved. There's no real love. That's what we did with Clinton. And the ordeal he went through. We were making money, so we, we're going to back the man. We don't want to upset our money. It isn't in us unless Christ is alive. So now we have born-again Christians. Every Christian that's saved is born again. Every Christian that's born again has Christ in them. But that's still not going to make a difference unless they believe Christ is in them. So we're back to the initial words, believe. The two biggest words in God's plan, believe and love. Just because Christ is in you 
doesn't mean you're going to return that love because you may be selfish. Somebody's always saying to me, how can these uh, church people fuss and fight all the time? How can these preachers go wrong? Uh, I told you, you can be right in the presence of God and not love him. You can be greatly used of God and not love him. I don't know why God does everything he does, but I know that love is the final test Lovest thou me more than these things, Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said. For the love of God would one lay down his life for another. I'm talking about something that isn't in you to do. It only comes through Christ. So there are two birthings. There's your natural birthing where the created part of you comes out, and that's uh, crude as it sounds, that's what mamas do, that's what the mother does. She manufactures a body. She manufactures this created part of God, the part of you that's created. But in your second birthing, it's not created by any person, not mother, not even yourself, because Jesus said it comes down from above, it's of the Spirit, it's not of man, it's of the Spirit. So your second birthing fixes you in the place that God wants you to be. Now, here's something I want you to see. I make this statement often, and I don't know whether I'm absolutely true or not, but from my short look into the world, I would say 90% of Christians are going to live and die and never know Christ lived in them. They never know that. They'll be full of the Holy Ghost. They'll jump and holler and have a spirit move and have anointing and all kinds of blessings, but they'll never know Christ lives in them because that message is hidden. It's not known in our, in our day. So they're going to live and die and never know about Jesus in them. Well, this means that our mission is to make this known as best we can. to make this gospel known. But the other important factor is, did God get what he wanted? If God could rebirth the natural man and make him a spirit being, Christ in him, and the natural man never know it, the spirit being never know it, the Christian never know Christ lives in him, if I say 90% is a percentage, and I'm probably liberal there, then why in the world did God do it? If his purpose was to get a lover in us that would love him, then why would he do it? Ah, you didn't get saved because you had need. You didn't get saved because you was going to hell. You thought that maybe. But that's not why God saved you. God saved you so he could birth his own family. Because you see, the created human has never been rebirthed. That takes in Israel 4,300 years of the Old Testament and everybody living today that's unsaved. What could God possibly get out of putting Christ in us? How could he do that? First, he could do it because Christ paid the price on the cross. Now follow this closely. Men get saved not because they get in trouble and just need a Savior. That's important. But they get saved because Jesus died for their sins and all God wants them to do is believe. That's all he wants. So when they believe and God baptizes them in the Christ, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, for the one spirit are we all baptized into one body, Christ. When you're baptized into Christ, you're there, God has you fit there. What does he get out of it if you never know that? It's simple. He makes it so whether you know it or not. How does God make a thing so even if you don't experience it? On the finished work of Christ. See, that's 
what he banks on. He doesn't bank on you. He banks on the finished work of Christ. You understand that? Now, the finished work of Christ. What is that? That's the work at the cross. 1 Corinthians 1 and 30 is our best verse for this. It says, Christ has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. What does that verse say? That verse says, if they never get smart, I make them knowledge because Christ is in them. If they never get righteous, I make Christ their righteousness. I don't depend on their righteousness. If they never get sanctified, I'll make Christ their sanctification and not depend on them being sanctified. And finally, if they never love me like they ought to, I put the lover in them and I make Christ the lover. What is that? That's the heart message of grace. Whether we ever mount up or not, God by Christ's death on the cross is able to get what he wants. Are you following me now? That's very important, you see. God's going to get what he wants. He's not going to let Jesus die in vain. And the moment any sinner believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, God baptizes him in the Christ. God puts Jesus in him, Christ in him, and he in Christ. And he stands before God perfect. If he never shows it, if he never expresses it, if it never comes out of him, God is not banking on it coming out of him. He's banking on what Jesus did at the cross. You understand that now? So how's God going to get reciprocating love? By Christ in us. What is, what is our obligation? Our obligation is to fall in love with the Jesus that's in us and to express it with the help of the Holy Spirit all we can. With our minds given to him, we are to express this thing. This Christ in us. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, is to lift up Jesus. Christ said when he comes, he will speak only of me. He'll not speak of himself. He'll speak only of me. Think about that. That's what the Holy Spirit is to do for us. He's to take this created part of us and bring it under subjection to the Christ that is in us. He's to help us keep that self under self crucified. so that Jesus can get out of us. But if you never live it and you never express it, and God put Jesus in you, he got what he wants because Christ loves the Father. But why would a human being want to live their life without that knowledge? Why would anybody want to continue trying to do it within themselves when it doesn't matter to God. He doesn't want you to try to love him. He wants you to let Christ flow through you. God doesn't want you to be righteous. He wants Christ to flow through you. Christ is your righteousness. He wants you to change your mind about yourself. He doesn't want to destroy yourself because yourself is what Jesus has to work through. But he wants to destroy the idea that you're a self without Christ. You're not. You are nothing to God without Christ. That's what he wants. He wants Christ to be all. Paul says that several times. He wants Christ to be your fulfillment. He wants Christ to be your completion. That's what he wants. He wants that created part of us to make a decision, to believe. What a mess it is to get people to believe. 4,300 years of this book, God really didn't have believers that understood because the plan wasn't complete. Doer religion was all they had in 4,300 years of the Scripture. You do something. Well, that's fixed in us. And we, yes, I'll do something, and I'll show God I love him. You think he wants that kind of love? I'm going to, I used to say, I'm going to build this building out here, folks, and this will show God we love him in this church. You think that's what he wants? Do you think the kind of love that would lay down itself, that would take its most priceless possession and kill it, do you think that kind of love, Calvary love and God love, do you think that's what it is? 
that I can mount it all up, but folks, you send me an offering for this, for this radio program, and God will bless you. You think that's what God's love is? Oh, all that may be necessary, but none of that touches what is God's love. 4,300 years of this book, God didn't have a believer. Now, you have to listen to what I'm saying. What he had was do a religion. Do a religion. Show you how mixed up we are. You couldn't handle that statement that for 4,300 years, God didn't have a believer. See, I say it again. For 4,300 years, God didn't have a believer in this book. What did he have? He didn't have people who believed. He had people who did. Doers. Doers. Doesn't matter whether you're talking about Moses or, or Noah or Abraham or whoever it is in the scriptures, they were all doers. What did Israel do? Israel, every time they sinned, had to offer a sacrifice to get forgiveness from God. What was their relationship with God? Doer religion. If they didn't offer those, if they didn't, if they didn't do it themselves, they couldn't be saved. John the Baptist comes along and he has it in fine print. He says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He had a good message, but he had to do a religion. He said, repent and be baptized. You do it. You do it. Well, it's do a religion. It's you doing it. Jesus of Nazareth preached the same message John the Baptist did. His final words were, to his disciples, I've taught you many things. And he said, all the things I have taught you out of Moses' law, I want you to do. Why? The kingdom was still being offered. But when he died on the cross, there was to be a radical change in that message. However, it came slowly. What did Peter preach on the day of Pentecost? Repent and be baptized and you'll receive the gift of the Spirit. What was it again? Do a religion. You do it. But the most thrilling thing that happens in the Scripture that has to do with God's love doesn't take place until Acts 16. What happened in Acts 16? Well, Paul and Silas got to singing and the jail doors fell off the prison and uh, all the prisoners were standing around there. The crooks were all standing around there wondering what to do. The doors had fallen off and the jailer came and fell down before Paul and cried out, what must I do to be saved? Now listen. You've never known how important those words were. For the first time in the history of this book and in the history of God's dealing with human beings, Paul said, believe. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and you shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Think about it. First time in 4,300 years of this book and the last 2,000 years we've lived since those words, most Christians are back to repent and believe and be baptized. They got it all mixed up. They got Christ in them. But it's a hard thing to believe what God said. Lucifer didn't believe. Adam didn't believe. The children of Israel had a hard time believing. Christ came to his own and they didn't believe. But that magnanimous moment when the Apostle Paul said to the jailer, simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's all he needed to do was to believe that Jesus died for him. And don't ever forget, dear friend, nobody goes to hell because of sin. Nobody goes to hell because they're bad. You can only go to hell because you don't believe. You're only lost if you don't believe. It isn't your sin that separates you. It's your mind. Oh, sin does separate you, all right. But that's not sin that destroys you. What destroys you is your own thinking. You do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the birthing, what we call the birthing, being born again, 
is an absolute necessity. God gets what he wants because he puts Christ in created vessels that have his touch created in the image of God and now for the first time God put a part of himself in that vessel, completed it, made it right. But the thing left for that creature is to believe. And the reason I'm on this series of sermons, messages, on the subject of the mind is because that's where it all finally centers. You stand perfect before God. I've told you that so many times. In spirit, you're perfect. It's in your soul mind that you're imperfect. And that's where you grow. That's where the Word takes hold. You don't need any more in your spirit. The birthing can bring no more. One seed's all you need to be at. Uh, to be birthed, to have a birthing. That's finished. That's complete. You stand before God complete in spirit. But it's in your soul mind that you're growing. And that's why this message becomes so very important and why we must deliver it to the world because Christians don't know that, let alone the world. I think if the world knew this, they would accept Jesus much quicker than our religious message is because they wonder about themselves. They wonder how they're made. They wonder how they're put together. They wonder why they do what they do. We've got the answer. The answer is that a created human is never completed. He's only completed by the rebirth. Christ in you is your hope of glory. Well, now that brings me to my text. In Romans 12, let's read the first verse. We're going to only read two verses. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies unto God. Know that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, we're going to talk about that verse because this is the verse that is so important to what I've been saying to you in this session. There are three things I want to say about this verse so you'll know where I am. First, he says, present your bodies unto God. Present your bodies unto God. Isn't this interesting? Why didn't he say get saved? Well, you're already saved. He's talking to saved people here. Then why is he asking for bodies? Listen to me now. He's asking for the bodies because that body once belonged to Satan. When you came out of the mother's womb, that body belonged to Satan and you had a sin nature. Joined to your spirit was another spirit, a Satan spirit. We see that as a sin nature. And so all your life until you were rebirthed, your body operated under a false impersonator, an illegal power. Why? Because you were created in the image and likeness of God and because of Adam's sin you were taken over by an illegal power who has misused your body, has used it to his own good. This is why sinful people do stupid things. That's Satan misusing their bodies. That's Satan tearing up their bodies. Why does he do that? because that's what's created in the image and likeness of God. Why does Satan deal with the minds of men like he does? Because the mind is the breath of God. That's his attack against God, God's creation of the creature and God's creation of the soul by the breath. So that's what the devil attacks. He can't attack the Jesus that's in me. Get this fixed in your mind. All these folks that are running around chasing devils and having warfare, remember, they can't even touch my spirit. It's perfect. It's Christ has me. So I have no problem. I have a problem with my thinking, my mind, my soul. Well, a body misused, torn up, never function properly but I get saved now listen to me closely if the true gospel is not preached when you get saved there will never be a change in your body operation and 
That's what Paul is dealing with here. There won't be a change. If you don't know Christ lives in this body, then your body is going to keep on acting the same way. And so this point doesn't get lost. You know where your identity comes from mostly? From your soul and body. That's where your identity comes from. In fact, most of your identity comes from body. Since Paul taught body, soul, and spirit, it is body and soul where most of your identity you have fixed in your mind who you are, it comes from your body. Most of your problems you have are from your body. Well, you thought wrong. You trained the body that way. But you see, that really wasn't you. That was a sin nature. It trained and mistrained your body in its operation. Now, what is Paul saying here? He's saying, now that you're born again, now that you're saved, now that you have Christ within you, have you ever taken a moment to present your body unto God? Now, we preached on that. I used to preach on that. Give God your body and eat right. And don't smoke, don't drink, and don't take drugs, and don't overwork and take care of your body. That was just a lighter touch. The real heart of that statement, present your bodies unto God, is that that's the created part of you that was in your mother's womb that Satan misused and mistreated. Now Satan is out. Christ is in. Have you ever taken a moment to offer that body unto God? You probably just took it for granted. Well, God knows that. The second thing that this says is, Present your bodies unto God, a living sacrifice. Now, I want to talk about that for a moment because that's what has to do with identity. A living sacrifice. What is a living sacrifice? Well, that means you don't get killed, but you're dying. You don't die, but it hurts. Why would he say a living sacrifice? To give your body back to God. Why is that a hurtful thing? Because it touches your identity. I was thinking of some of the things that had to do with that. Uh, you know, if you go to a place to quit smoking, uh, you know what they do, most of them? They deal with your body first. That's right. You, you think you've got a habit in your mind of smoking, and they say, no, it's a body thing first. So what do they do? Uh, there was one of them that had a little bell or a shock or something. That every time you reached in your purse or to your shirt pocket to get a cigarette, it would go off. Why? It was a body thing. It was your body craving. So they wanted to stop that pull toward a cigarette. You ever think of how many things are what you do to make you who you are? The way a person drives a car, that's the way they are. Works out as a body thing. Women fix their hair all the time, working on their hair. That's a body thing. But what has that done? That's given you an identity. Like my wife says, I wouldn't dare go out there looking like this. So it was a body thing that had to do with her identity. I'm just the opposite, and she says, he'll go out looking anyway. <laughs> well, that's a body thing with me. I don't think highly of myself, and she thinks highly of herself. It's all body. Much of your life is put together for what you do in your body, and that determines who you think you are. So when you make that change from the body being yours, and oh, I'm so tired of hearing women say, it's my body I can do as I please. With. See, what well, has that become the battle cry of this day? My body, I'll do as I please with it. I talked to a fellow the other day uh, somewhere, I don't know where I was, in uh, Cleveland or somewhere, he, was a, he climbed mountains, and he heard me say some things like this, and he said, you think I'm misusing my body? I said, what do you think? Well, he said, I really do take risks. He said, I kind of get a thrill out of doing that, so I do it. I said, yeah, that's why guys ride motorcycles and why they go in high-powered boats and, and uh, do all the strange things they do. 
But I said, you, you answer the question yourself. If you've given that body to Christ, then you're not going to be taking all these risks with it. See? Well, that really hurt. You know why? That was his identity. That's who he was by what he did. Present your bodies unto God as a living sacrifice. And the last line is the third thing in this verse that's important. Paul says, it's your reasonable service. Reasonable. To me, that means two things. It first means that God fixed you in your mind and body so you could give that body to him. You can do it. It may hurt a little. But you need to give Christ that body. You didn't have a choice in giving to Satan. You came into the world like that. But now you've got a choice to give it to Christ, and it's going to hurt because that's going to break up the lid when you've got with your old way of doing things. It's going to hurt a little. But Paul says that's your reasonable service. It's reasonable. It's reasonable because God has fixed you so you can do it, and he'll help you. It's also reasonable if you love him. You hear Paul talking about that? He says to the man, love your body as you love your wife and vice versa. What is he talking about? He's talking about a kind of love for the Christ that's in us that's bigger than we ever knew. You know why I take care of my body? Because that's the only way Jesus can get around in me. Now, when I can't get around anymore, he's still going to be in me, and I'm still going to be doing what I can to express him because I love him. I love it. But I take care of this body as long as I can to express Christ. Now we're ready for the key verse, and I'll be done. Verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, this verse takes in so many things, including the will of God, I won't talk about now. I just leave you with the one line out of it that has to do with this series of messages that I'm bringing on the mind of Christ. This opens up to us the fact that the mind must be renewed. You have the mind of Christ, but it needs to be renewed. This means that the same things you know to be facts need to be gone through again and again. There's no such thing as you saying, well, I really know that already. I always hear people say, well, I've heard that for years. I know that already. They don't. If they knew it like it's to be known, they wouldn't have said that. What is it we know? What we know, we know at the peak of that knowing. For instance, uh, we know certain things because of certain circumstances and situations. But we also forget what I told a woman uh, in Tulsa night for last. I said, you, your forgetter is going to work better than your remember, whatever your age is. And you know what it is so easy to forget? It's so easy to forget the things that have to do with you as Christ in comparison to remembering the things that have to do with you as you. And you follow that? The things you're going to forget as a spiritual being are the things that have to do with you as Christ. Now, you've already experienced that, haven't you? You got on the job and you lost your temper. That was you as you. You say, well, I've always been like that. They can take me or leave it. You see, you haven't given him yourself yet. Your body hadn't been presented to him. But what you forget is you as Christ. That's what the mind has a hard time with because it has a whole lot more training for the devil than it does for Christ. And you never like to speak of yourself as being trained by the devil, but you have the sin nature, and it caused you to be adverse to your creation. And your old mind now, somebody says, well, the believer still has a sin nature. No, he's still got the same old mind. That's what he's got. It was in his, it's in his thinking. It's Satan is out, Christ is in, but it's the mind that hasn't been changed. And as I've always said, it's hard to change the mind. And from this point on, we will deal sometime 
I think, with the term, the renewing of the mind. Well, I'm going to quit right there because I tell you, you've been the best group I've seen here all day long. You're the closest to the Father's house we're going to get. And you know, I want to say this to you. I don't believe the world's going to get any better. The kingdom preachers can keep preaching that like the ostrich with his head in the sand. The world isn't going to get any better. But what's going to get better is the Father's relationship to you and I. We're just going to, we're just going to get hidden in the rock. We're going to get hidden in him. We're going to get hidden in his love. We're just going to get closer and closer to our Heavenly Father by the Christ that is in us. So cheer up, will you? Cheer up. Reach over and take your neighbor by the hand, will you? Take your, this is the way we dismiss here. Take your neighbor by the hand and say, I see Jesus in you. I see Jesus in you. In your life and all that you do. I see Jesus in you because I see Jesus That's what you need to know. He's in you. I see Jesus in you. He's in you. Hallelujah. In my life and all that I do, I see Jesus in me. Amen. That's it. God love you.